Hazel is one of the earliest trees to come into flower. And since it's never as tall as most of the other trees in closed woodland, uh, the branches are lower down, so it's a bit easier for us to examine the flowers. Especially in a place like this. This is a ring fort, uh, where the bushes are safe from browsing cattle. Now, like most trees, hazel has separate male and female flowers, and they are produced on the same tree. The botanical term for this is monoecious. Separate male and female flowers, but growing on the same tree. Uh, there are, in fact, this is the same with most trees. The only real common exceptions would be holly uh, and willow, where you have separate male and female flowers, but they're growing on, on different plants, on different trees. And again, like most other trees, uh, the flowers are pollinated not by insects, but by the wind. And since the chances of the wind carrying pollen from the stamens of one plant to the stigmas of another are much less when the plant is relying on the wind rather than insects, vast quantities of pollen are produced. On the other hand, uh, since the plant is not relying on insects, it means that the flowers can be produced early in the year because it doesn't have to wait for insects to be around. And this is important uh, because if it were to produce its flowers later in the year, the leaves would get in the way and pollen transfer would be far less efficient on that account. So these are the male flowers, the catkins. It's rather surprising that there actually wasn't a word in English for catkins until an English botanist in 1578 borrowed the Dutch word catechin, which means kittens. Uh, and Irish hasn't improved much on that because the Irish word is cochini, which again means little cats. So the catkin consists of a, a stack of tiny individual male flowers. And the structure of the, each of the individual male flowers is, is very simple. Uh, there are no petals because they don't need petals. Uh, the individual flower simply consists of what looks like a, an inverted saucer, a small inverted saucer to, to which are attached four stamens. Uh, and when the catkin is young, it's in a vertical position, but as the stamens begin to ripen, you can see the way it becomes pendulous. So what we have here is a, a sort of a wobbly stack of uh, individual male flowers. Each flower consists of nothing more than four stamens attached to a sort of saucer-like structure called a bract. And this is two smaller bracts or scales on either side of it. Uh, the catkins are erect until ready to release their pollen and then they become pendant. So that stack of little saucers, each with the four stamens attached, is now turned upside down and they dangle to facilitate the launch of pollen on the breezy days that are favoured for pollen dispersal. Now, what about the female flowers? Well, the female flowers, uh, they look really just like buds, uh, a, a series of tight overlapping scales. Uh, most of the outer scales are just protective, and at the centre of the flower we have eight to twelve tiny little female flowers, again two, two attached to each scale, and each of the flowers with two feathery red stigmas. Uh, the feathery structure is designed uh, to intercept pollen being carried by the wind. Uh, an important point to note here is that the pollen is dry and powdery, which is different from most familiar flowers, uh, where it tends to be sticky or clumpy, or often with kind of spiky protuberances uh, to facilitate its adherence to the bodies of insects. When you understand that much, uh, it's easy to think that it's simply a matter of the wind coming along and carrying away the pollen uh, to female flowers somewhere else. But in fact it isn't as simple as that, and the reason is this. Remember the pollen, the pollen is dry and powdery. If it becomes wet, it's no longer viable. So it's no good if the wind is blowing and it's raining at the same time, because that will render the pollen inviable and useless. So what happens is this. As soon as the flowers, the male flowers begin to open, they shed their pollen on a still day and the pollen simply drops down onto the inverted top of the little saucer below, on top of the flower below. Uh, 
which has a kind of a hollow in it and there's a kind of an upturned lip at the edge to stop the pollen from falling off. And then when the weather is calm but a gentle breeze is blowing, the pollen is wafted away uh, to nearby flowers. If conditions become blustery and wet, the pollen is sheltered by the umbrella effect overhead of the saucer-like bract to which the stamens are attached. Once fertilisation has taken place, it is these cones of female flowers with their red top knots that develop into clusters of hazelnuts, food not only for us, but for the nut weevil, just one of the wide range of animals that depend on hazel. Hazel is the host plant of the parasitic toothwort, a fascinating species we hope to look at later in the year. Among the many fungi associated with hazel, the most eye-catching at this time of year is the scarlet elf cup, which lives on decaying stems. In an earlier Ireland, where every community had to be self-sufficient, few trees were held in higher regard than hazel. In fact, in Gaelic tradition and law, uh, it was ranked along with great trees like oak and elm among the seven nobles of the wood. Its versatile, pliable, quick-growing stems were used to make hurdles for fences and trackways uh, and for making staves and rods. The timber itself could be used for making bowls, uh, small items of furniture and a wide range of farm tools. The nuts were very valuable as food. But above and beyond all that, Hazel seems to have crossed a certain threshold in the Irish mind and it had a sort of otherworldly sacred status. And perhaps that had something to do uh, with the symbolism of the catkins appearing in February and March uh, with all the hope of the new year ahead. The snake banishing staff of St. Patrick was made of hazel. And it isn't a purely Irish thing because in the classical tradition, the wand of Mercury, the winged messenger of the gods, was made of hazel. In the Middle Ages, the traditional pilgrim staff always had to be made of hazel. And there's a late modern echo of this mystical reputation of hazel in some of the strange, uh, almost ethereal poems of W.B. Yeats. Some of which, some of you may remember from your school days when it was on the syllabus, the Song of Wandering Angus. I went out to the hazel wood because a fire was in my head and cut and peeled a hazel wand and hooked a berry to a thread. And when white moths were on the wing and moth-like stars were flickering out, I dropped the berry in a stream and caught a little silver trout. And if you want to know what happens next, the Song of Wandering Angus is on dozens of websites. <laughs>